So quick show of hands, really quick. Who has a finance background in this room? Excellent. We do have some folks with a finance background. Awesome. Who has a threat intelligence background? Do threat and tell? Awesome. Very, very cool. So when I was thinking about this presentation, putting it together, I was thinking about this concept of a fire tower. And the idea of a fire tower is that you're standing up above the forest and you've got a 360 view and your job really is to look for early warning signals in the form of smoke signals, right? Because you know that when there is smoke, there is fire. And it's really a way to make sure that you don't have an out of control forest fire. And so we started thinking about this concept and applying it to some regulations and some other things. It seemed to kind of fit. And so just quick ground rules here. This is interactive. I'm gonna have some time for questions at the end, but you feel free to interrupt. We can go as deep as you'd like. But you know, for those that have been following the news, just feel free to blurt out, like how much did the United Healthcare breach cost? Wild guess. A lot. <laughs> Give me a number next to a lot. Anyone? 40 million. 40 million. Any other guess? 100 million. When, when, when you factor in all the, all the, all the businesses that were affected, every doctor's office and healthcare provider, it's huge. Huge numbers. And they probably couldn't see patients for several days. Right? Absolutely. So big numbers. Any other guesses in terms of numbers? 200. 200 million. Excellent. What about the solar winds breach? How much did that cost? Billions. Billions of dollars. Okay. Any other guesses? What about the MGM breach? How much did that cost? Oh, uh, wait. The Caesar breach cost exactly $15 million. $15 million. And they, and they paid, right? <laughs> Not the only cost, right? There's other costs. $100 million, $100 million in lost business. Any other guesses? Awesome. So we're engaged. We know a little bit about this. So. A little bit about me in the background here. So I'm a recovering CISO. So I've been in the financial services space for the last few years. Uh, the security and the, stra the strategy and the execution of the security program. Done over 37 mergers and acquisitions, but I've also spent my time securing banks and tech as well. And so on my journey in all these mergers and acquisitions, if you've ever done enough of these, you start to inherit certain things. You start to see certain patterns, right? And if you're working with private equity firms or venture capital firms, you notice that they have a different game they're playing. They're looking at financial statements, but the cyber element is uh, always in question, right? Especially when you start to inherit and bring another company into your environment or if you're divesting. And so as I was going through this journey and started looking at what business looked like, pursuing ed executive education, looking at business, and then ultimately going into finance, I learned, hey, Financial ana analysts play a different game. They look at numbers and they're looking for patterns. They're able to go through and see things over the course of time, especially as they're comparing it expressed through these financial statements, especially for publicly traded companies. So partnered with Dr. June Nee, who could not be here today, unfortunately, because he's in the process of moving. Uh, he's a big brain analytics person, a savant when it comes to taking data, visualizing it. And so together we're forming a team and a project to go through and analyze and look for smoke signals. Now, I'm gonna take you a little bit on this journey. So right now, cyber due diligence looks a certain way. We think it should look potentially another way with, financial analy uh, with the financial analysis. We think that there's some patterns and things that are of interest that we wanna share with you. Regulatory changes are requiring disclosures. And we think that's a wealth of information, especially when you know what to look for and you start to look at these patterns. And when we think about a little bit of common ways of doing threat intelligence, we think there's a novel way of building a new model. So we'll start to share that. And so we started off with this, but you know, you've all seen these headlines, United Healthcare, MGM, Solar Winds, right? Not to pick on any one particular company, but you see all these headlines, we see numbers. And so these are some of the estimates as quoted from these headlines, right? Big numbers, and they vary, right? They vary based on the estimates at the time. These are mostly year to date. But while we take a look at these headlines, we start to pick what happened. These are publicly traded companies that are otherwise healthy and posting these financial statements. So let's start to look at what is inside of a security and exchange committee 
Security and Exchange Commission and SEC required filing. There's two filings. There's a 10K, that's an annual disclosure. It's kind of like posting a selfie, right? You go through and you have your financials, you have what risk factors, what your business is doing. You've got the management that's disclosing things that are important for a potential or existing investor to know. And then you've got the numbers. Then you've got some other supplementary disclosures. And so that happens annually, depending on the fiscal year. And it's important. It's important, it's a requirement to go through and say, this is everything you should invest and this is what's interesting to you, potential or existing investor. Then if you experience an event, right? An event could come in any form, a merger, an acquisition, a divestiture, something that is material, you disclose it in the form of an 8K. And it's a special event, right? And as of December of 2023, there's now a requirement if you experience a cyber event to disclose this type of information. And so it provides a new form of information, a new body of knowledge for us to see, hey, what took place? So when we think about our threat intelligence today, um, what? When you said that the 9K is required for September 2023, um, what's the threshold for that? Because companies can see cyber events of some nature, you know, every day, essentially. Yeah. So the question is, what is the threshold for disclosing an 8K, right? And it's at the determination, it's really up to the company when materiality has been met. Materiality is a very fancy, expensive word that lawyers get to sort out but effectively requires a company to go through with the right general counsel, CFO, legal, outside legal, and disclose that something has taken place. And it's still in question, it's still relatively new. To answer? Another question in the back. I'm sorry, you have to speak a little bit more. Does it require the updates after the breach? Interim updates. So yes, there are interim updates. And so at the point in which you, the question was, are there other uh, incremental updates that are required? Absolutely. So the idea is to inform a existing or potential investor and the regulator that something has taken place, a service outage, something that could affect the overall financial outcome of a existing or potential investor. Great questions. So we dig a little bit deeper on this and we think about today's threat intelligence, right? It's really a life cycle, right? So there's different forms, there's different activities that take place, but in effect, you have a direction, right? You, have, you set out to go and discover some information. You go and you collect data from available sources to you, public, private, otherwise, right? You process the data, you analyze it with subject matter experts and you disseminate it to the world to, to make an action on. Right? And then you follow that life cycle. That's our traditional threat intelligence at a very high level. And there's different forms, right? There's strategic, where you're gathering public pieces of information. There's things that you're probably more commonly thinking of, your TTPs, right? The tools, techniques of what adversaries are doing, the operational aspects, or even the technical, the things that you're able to discover internally if you're really looking at the types of uh, technical types of things that are out there. And so the idea is that it's not really a life cycle. It's really the flow of information, the gathering of information, right? You're following a cycle. And so let's take a look at this, right? Our common threat intelligence today yields this type of activities, right? So here's an example, right? Mandiant, well-known company, right? And this is what took place for solar winds. This is Sunburst, right? This is an example of what took place, threat actors, indicators of compromise, and what our conventional threat intelligence yields today. But where is the $40 million in this, right? How does the financial analyst understand this? How does a potential investor understand that in the form of an 8K per se? But this is what we think about an example of technical threat intelligence. Another example, great company, Level Blue Labs, right? This is what MGM looks like when we perform threat intelligence. Again, indicators of compromise, right? Some of the operations, what took place at the time when the bad actor impersonated the help desk and did the, what they did, created a week-long service outage. Another example of our strategic threat intelligence, this is Huntress, another excellent company, right? Gathering information publicly available to really disclose what took place. Somebody had impersonated the help desk, went through the, the access broker, things were purchased, had access, and led to effectively a week-long outage. 
But where's the number, right? Where's the $100 million in this? And so when we think about this, we think about pointing not just at the publicly available pieces of information, but pub pointing it at the publicly disclosed financial information using some financial analysis, there's some interesting things, right? Because the purpose of financial analysis or the purpose of managing your financial risk is to prevent the loss of money, right? It's preventing a bad investment. And so when we start to compare and contrast cyber threat intelligence with financial analysis, there's really some commonality, right? Both set out to combine and create as part of a comprehensive risk strategy, known unknowns, if you will, right? Identify financial risks, identify threat actors, identify adversaries that are targeting you. You have a goal to minimize your risk. And you're using those similar techniques, putting in front of the right information, the right users to make an informed decision at that time. So when we start to connect the dots, we start to think about, let's use this database of publicly disclosed information, EDGAR, which is what it's called. So there's this Security Exchange Commission database that's out there, it's publicly available. And when you go and you pull it from anything that says 8K in cyber, from December of 2023 to let's just say July, we've got 2,200 8K filings mentioning cyber. Now, not all of these are related to an incident, and I'll talk through that. You got, just like anything, you have to distill signal to noise. But with the requirements, there's some really interesting information out there, right? You have described cybersecurity processes, who you're working with, effectively what took place, financial information, and so it's a wealth of information and it's gonna be continuing to evolve, right? This is relatively new. And so when we think about it, we start to, to actually dissect and distill what these 8Ks are. There's a question, yes? Uh, yeah, when, so since you're disclosing information, um, are you finding at all that companies that have had cybersecurity incidents were disclosing contingency um, losses the question is, do we find that companies are disclosing contingency losses as a result of their events? And it depends. Depends on where they're at with the event. It depends on where they're at with the whole litany of financials that adjust. And if you hold that thought, I'm going to go a little bit more into kind of where that information comes in. But it's a great question. Thank you. So this might actually help with that. So when we start to to distill the 8Ks and the information that's out there, not all the data is useful, right? So the top example is an example of an 8K related to a cyber incident. So it hit the criteria, right? Cyber 8K and the, the threshold, but you can start to see the changes in revenue, right? The changes in expenses, net losses. And again, distilling it in, you can start to, again, depending on the ratios you use in the industry and how they carry their assets, you can start to distill some of that information. So this is an example of something that's useful, right? Again, calling your attention to something that you wanna inspect a little bit further based on some numbers and some words. The other is an example of an 8K, but it just so happened that the company had the word cyber in its name, right? Cyber apps world was merging. So it's an example of something that we would not want to pay attention to per se, right? The idea again is that not all of it's useful, but there's a lot of information, especially when we point it out at a, a at a larger level. And so when we think about financial analysis in its most basic form, you've got money coming in, the form of income, money going out with expenses. And trained and seasoned financial analysts look at things a little bit differently, right? Assets and liabilities, ratios, and they're looking at things to determine, again, that they're gonna make a right investment, make the right bet. But there's different things that indicate the health of a company. And just like with threat intelligence, just like anything, you wanna call attention to things that are of interest to you. And you can trigger off of this. And so example of that, right? Understanding what is inside of the 8K related to cyber, right? Of course, you're looking for if a company's going through some sort of financial distress, as an example. Uh, is there an acquisition or a divestiture or a lot of movement over the last course of years? If you've ever worked in a security program, if you've gone through many mergers and acquisitions, many times there's a lot of change and there's a lot of freeze and you've, you've got potentially legacy things that you're dealing with. And you could start to see that in some of the operations. You know, any 
any relation to, to, the, to the obligation to not, to, to, to not pay down the debt, right? Or if you're taking on additional debt. Again, triggers that allow us to analyze it, look at things a little bit deeper. And so when we start to look at this thing, take a look at the cash flows and the debt, everything else, again, there's some triggers, there's some interesting information that's there. So let's start to see this in practice. And so what better company to take a look at than MGM, right? And so again, we're in this beautiful city of Las Vegas. And so just to kind of level set here, about a year ago, MGM experienced a cyber event that caused a week long service outage to the tune of about $100 million. And so it's interesting about this is that it predated the requirement for the disclosure of an 8K, but it's one of the first of its kind. It provided all the transparency that we would wanna see. So it provides a comparison for other companies in industry or in other comparable industries. And there's some really interesting things. So we asked the question, again, performing an analysis of what took place looking at the numbers. And so when we think about this, again, taking a look at between 2020 and 2023 leading up to the event. Taking a look at the financials since doing some trend analysis. Well, at a high level, the trends indicate that there's some challenges related to cost utilization, which could affect long-term financial stability. Well, tell me more. Moving over to number two. Taking a look at the liabilities and looking at some of the ratios that a financial analyst would look at, uh, there has been a significant increase in liabilities from 2020 to 2022. In other words, if you start to look, there were some acquisitions, opening and closing of things, right? Bringing on other assets, bringing on identity programs, bringing the assets together as an example. Taking a look at what happened between 2021 going up to 2024 at the end of the event, well, the data would suggest that there was an operational shift there was streamlining that was taking place, right? There was improving, creating operational efficiencies. And now it's not unusual for companies to expand and contract, right? But what's interesting is that while looking at the numbers and automating some of the analysis, we're able to start to see some patterns. And so in 2023, leading right up to the event, the data would suggest that there was a strategic shift towards consolidation, right? It was to really pay down, manage the debt, and that comes in the, in the form of cost cutting or potentially divesting. And so when we start to think about this as a potential pattern, as something to compare other companies going through it, it's interesting, something to again trigger off of. And when we look at the operating cash flow, again, was there money there to go through and fund and operate? We have that data. So again, we have a comparison because when you look at companies in industry, whether the gaming, whether in their, the healthcare, financial, banks, tech, they all carry their assets differently. And you can start to look for those patterns just like a financial analyst does. So those are what some of the numbers suggest. And there's a question in the back. The, the question is how many Yeah, so compared to other countries, I guess the way that I look at it, the way that I think about it, there's generally accepted accounting principles, right? That really govern the ratios that are here in the United States. Some of them are accepted internationally, but they actually have different principles. The purpose of really finding some commonality is again, looking at the finances, looking at what, go ahead. Yes. Gotcha. Got it. Yes. So the question is, again, if you're looking at this and you see signs of, of danger or something that is of interest, could someone or something from the outside look at this? Yes. Which is part of why we're calling this, uh, why we're calling this of interest. Thank you. The other question. I'm sorry? There are the PCA OB guidelines for the revenue recognition of SaaS companies. 
That's right. Are there any PCOB guidelines or upfront that determine how the accounts have to be dealt with for cyber losses? The question is, the PCA AOB has specific guidance for SaaS companies. Is there any guidance that's out there that's... I'm actually trying to do a parallel here because one is about how you recognize, because basically the idea is what, how do you form these different accounts? Right. And how the account for them in the books. And that, was, that used to be a big problem with SaaS companies and that was dealt with. Because of how technology companies carry their assets. Completely different problem. But right now we have a bigger problem here with cyber security, cyber security breaches, losses. Are there any guidelines on how to handle this from an accounting perspective? Are there any guidelines? I don't know that I can answer that one directly right now, but let me table that one and see if I can come back to it, right? Because the focus is really on the, the body of knowledge, but that is a great question. Let me come back to that one. Yes? I wanted to send you back on past summer, Mr. Graham. You did not. Again, so if this, maybe we're looking at insurance companies and scrutinizing that or Insurance companies, portfolio companies, venture capital companies, investors might have an interest in this information. We think that it absolutely has another way of looking at a risk profile, which is why that's of interest. Because again, if you've ever gone through mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, and you're comparing your programs, again, the finances are effectively reviewed, but there's no line item for cyber. There's no line item for technology per se, but there's some operational costs that again, certain companies of like industries carry. They look at those ratios and as a trained financial analyst, you look for that, right? You're looking for efficiencies and to increase profitability, you're driving efficiencies. So again, that's a, some of the early warning signals and things that we're doing. Excellent questions and I'm glad you guys are picking up what we're putting down here, right? Because these again, this is just based on what the numbers suggest with trend analysis, using some of the ratios that are generally accepted accounting principles governed by the PCAOB, right? So the idea is we've got some triggers, right? And as we start to go through and continue to distill the words, again, we can automate what the words say. And so if we go through and we take a look at the 10K and what was said in comparison to an 8K, and we just say, all right, anytime you see the word cybersecurity or anything of interest, right? Regulation, incident, whatever it may be, take the paragraph before, take the paragraph after, and let's do some analysis. And um, there's some interesting things that are there. Again, because there are requirements to disclose information to make sure that we protect that financial investment, right? So you could see, you know, there was no incident reported during a particular period of time. But once the 8K was filed, as an example, there was an adjustment in EBITDA, right? There was a mention of uh, adjusted bookings, right? There was a decrease in profitability. There were services outages, right? Because again, these are all smoke signals, right? Because we're looking for the fire, right? When we continue on with the analysis, you know, was it mentioned, right? Is a company operating looking at this from a, a risk perspective? And again, there's differing uh, views of this and they all go through a legal review, but we're looking for the patterns, right? We're looking for pattern analysis because Again, these are smoke signals. Where's the fire, right? And in the eyes of the Security and Exchange Commission, here's your fire, right? The drop in stock price, right? And so when we go through and we take a look and marry those smoke signals with the fire, and we start to see pretty interesting information. So right as the event was being experienced, stock was, price was trading at $43.74. And then upon the uh, filing of the 8K with other things that were going on, right? We saw a 4% drip dip. That's interesting, that's interesting, right? Because as we go through and we start to see and ride that dip all the way down to its lowest point, 34.49, represents a 22% drop. There's some real interesting information because the available stock, $340 million of that, experienced about a 20% drop or $68 million, right? That's what this is for. The disclosures of the 8Ks are to prevent the financial losses in this form, but we've not looked at it this way. Again, looking for the signals and also reviewing what is the after effect, right? And so this is one company, right? This is one company that we profile. There are many companies inside of, uh, that are publicly traded, about 3,400. And so when we start to point at the entire database, again, looking at specific information, you have to do something with all of that information to start to profile and run your experiments, especially if you're modeling. And so 
you start to introduce your lag plots, right? And that is basically the distribution of the information, the ratios, and the things that are of interest over time. And then you need to go through and distribute your model, right? So on the right-hand side, or the, yeah, the right-hand side here, you're starting to see, again, some information that's being distilled, and we're looking for some patterns, again, based on the ratios, based on the information, based on some other things that we think are of interest. And then on the other side, again, there's not, there's not a specific cost of security as a line item, but there are some estimates, there are some guesses based on how companies carry their assets that we can distill. And so there's some form of a productivity, there's some form of a company that has gone through and done certain things and not experienced event against others. Again, looking for early warning signals. And so you go through, you pick your model, or in, our, or in our case, you make your own, and you're looking for something, right? The assumption of what the cost of the cybersecurity looks like. And so there's some form of risk mitigation, there's some sort of productivity, there's some sort of absence of an 8K disclosure because an incident was not solved for, and then again, you've developed or are beginning to develop a profile of interest. Again, pointing at the entire database within your date ranges. And so when you start to think about this, it's kind of like, again, being on that fire tower with binoculars, the left and the right lens, and you start to distill some information, and then you've got a standard deviation, right? And you're starting to go through and have the ability to run the experiments, to then compare the MGMs, the United Healthcares, the Solar Winds, the Clorox, the AT&Ts against all the other things, and as time goes on, we'll start to see more and more of this because, again, this requirement is novel and it is allowing us to develop early warning signals or things that are of interest. And so we start to think of this, again, this is the two lenses of the, uh, of the, the binoculars here and bringing it all together. What does it mean, right? Well, what it means is that you get the opportunity to draw a box. If I could leave you with just one thing, it's this. All of this information is to be able to draw a box. And so the little dots represent particular companies of interest that have certain patterns that we've thought to be of interest. And the whole purpose of this is to decide on whether or not you invest on what's inside of the box or bet on what's outside of the box. And so with all of that, what we've, again, just to kind of just to conclude here, what we've talked about is the regulatory requirements that are posting out, that are requiring us to post a lot of information. Information that could be of interest. Information that we believe could be an early warning signal. And when you start to use the financial insights from the 8Ks and the 10Ks, you marry it with the cyber threat intelligence techniques that are out there, you can then start to go and overall see what the company is doing and what the outputs are and develop some early warning signals. And so with that, I thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you in its current nascent form. I'm Brandon at firetowerai.com, and I'd be glad to open up the floor to any questions that you may have. If you don't mind going up to the mic, yeah, I think they can hear you, but thank you for the questions. So it seems like the purpose of the AK filings is to prevent financial losses, correct? But from the graph you showed, and we don't, I don't, you know, it's not a big data set. Seems like when they announce the AK that there's a momentary dip in the stock price. So it's, you could kind of use that to predict that there, with these filings, that there could affect the stock price and bet on that loss. Is there, that correct? There is an opportunity to potentially short a company, right? Um, there, there, you do allow for that. Um, I think one of the points, and I'm glad that you brought that up, is that on average, a company will go through and rebound from a cyber incident in about 90 days. But that initial But that initial dip. dip. So if you were, if you were uh, going through the Edgar, because this is following, this is in Edgar, right? That's right and you notice new filings, you could use that as, a, as data for what you think the price is gonna do at least momentarily. It, 
again, helps understand what a profile could look like, either in industry, recovery, or otherwise. Right. Because again, the purpose of the 8K is saying, we've experienced an outage, financials are going to be adjusted. If you made an investment, you might lose on that investment. So here's everything we know to be transparent about the particular event. Okay. And so on average, again, and this is one of the interesting conversations about this, you experience a cyber event, but you could see around December, you know, you've actually made more money, right? Why is that? There's many, many variables that affect yeah, the financial statement. But again, this, there's $100 million here, or there's $68 million in overall drop if you take the bottom point, right? That's interesting information when you look at the numbers, and you start to combine it with triggers. Right. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. So as a recovering CISO, then, would you say you can also look at this from the internal perspective and use this as, uh, actually, if you go back two slides, um, to the, it's going to be the cost to oh, investment. Yeah. This. So, yeah. So using this then to help justify expenditures and spending on security, right? Showing it from an internal perspective, right? you're competing with your CF, not competing, but you're, you're trying to convince your CFO, you're trying to convince other people to invest in some of these things. Do you see this as a way to help in explaining that in terms that they can understand? Um, I, yes, the short answer to that is yes. So when you think about uh, diligence, especially if you're a portfolio company, you've got company yep. A, company B, company C, mm -hmm. right? And you've gone through and the financials look good. You may be wanting to do a private equity play. Right? You're looking to provide leverage and you know, do certain things to acquire to make it more attractive. Mm -hmm. You might be acquiring a company to sell off certain parts or to you know, invest money and invest resource to put it back out into the world. Depends on what you're looking for. So one of the measures of diligence is being able to look at how do you compare against your peers in industry or your other like scenarios. And sure. what we're looking for are particular patterns and profiles to then compare and say, hey, Again, in the case of MGA, expansion, contraction, movement over time, and we experience an outage and we experience an event, there might be some other comparisons that are out there. So absolutely, that's, a, that's an applicable use case that we contemplate. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. Along those lines, I noticed that right now it looks like you are focusing on areas around you know, the word cybersecurity, for lack of a better term. Have you looked at other aspects, particularly filings that aren't necessarily explicitly cybersecurity related, things like layoffs, labor relations, all that sort of stuff that are other indicators of an organization under stress that don't necessarily immediately translate to a change in revenue? So the answer to that is yes. And the reason for that is you can appreciate right, a lot of the operating expenses, like people don't have a specific line item, right? And so when we're looking for financially distressed companies, just like in other cases, you know, you're looking for those indicators. The words vary, right? For the sake of this presentation, we just keyed off of cybersecurity. But again, the analysis is looking for indicators of distress, which then tr trigger an analysis, which then helps us form a profile. Thank you. Um, kind of a two-part question. Firstly, how laggy is the data in the filings? How, how much time do you get before you can perform the analysis in a way that's statistically relevant? And then secondly, what's the predictive value of this information? Like, have you been able to test the, the false positive rates on these signals that you're picking up on? Yep, so the first question, just to make sure I got it, um, the first question is how laggy is the data, right? So the the requirement for the filing of an 8K is relatively novel, right? Uh, so again, from December up until present day. So that's the corpus of information that we have at this time. Of course, there are other 8Ks and other disclosures and comparisons, right? But we're specifically looking at that and preparing for additional 8K filings to then build those profiles. And so there are regulatory requirements that necessitate putting it out once you feel like you're going to affect shareholder value or an investor value. And that's kind of in question because it's, is it at the time of which you experience the event or at the time in which you've declared it to be material or the time in which you've notified, again, cat, rat, dog, regulator, as opposed to the SEC? 
So there's a lot of complexity and it varies. If you're healthcare regulated versus tech, you're gonna have a lot more regulatory hoops to go through, so it'll appear more laggy as a pair compared to an industry that is not as heavily regulated, but publicly traded. Does that answer your question? The second piece to that um, question, re remind me again. The false positive rate. So what's in the box is in question for us, right? Because again, it's based on the data to date. And so the predictive uh, analysis component is uh, something that uh, we, we believe and we'll see. So it's a function of time. But we'll be able to answer that as time progresses and our models improve. Great questions, thank you. So I'm afraid this doesn't have much to do with fire tower per se, but would it be possible or has it happened or do you think it's possible that somebody could like basically short a stock <laughs> and then attack the company? You could use data for good. You could use data for evil, yeah. right? At one point, it was very popular for adversaries to go through and look at public, public uh, 10K filings and some companies in the spirit of providing transparency would post how much cyber insurance they had. And that came back to bite them, right? Oh, because yeah. again, there was no way of you know, negotiating what the ransom payout would be. It was actually there in the spirit of disclosure. So again, the idea is that there's information and you could use it for good, you could use yeah. it for bad, uh, but it's all again in how you decide you want to use it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great question. Uh, so, so my question is really, if you had a really hard nosed uh, CFO who was looking at this data and went, well, you know, you said if we have a big cyber event, the share price will be back to where it was in 90 days. You know, we'll commit to improving security. We'll embark on a big program. I don't need to embark on that cost now. I'll wait till something happens. And then if it does, we'll bite the dip for 90 days. We'll be back to where we need to be. What would your argument be to someone who put forth uh, that kind of um, position? Yeah, so the great question. So the ultimate expression of risk, in my opinion, is if you're publicly traded through these 10 Ks, right? Budgets are approved ultimately by the CFO, right? Through the CEO board, but through the CFO, rolling up and rolling down. And so if you've gone through any type of changes, um, you know, cost cutting, uh, holding things static, potential divestitures, or the companies in financial distress, that's part of the conversation, is having a more informed conversation with those financial folks, the CFOs. And so my aha moment didn't come to me until I actually sat down with the financial analysis, fo the, the analysts that are very skilled. And I asked the question, I said, how many times do you talk to your operational teams? They're like, barely any, right? So love your financial business partner, love your CFO organization, speak their language because they're looking at it differently. If there's no company to protect because again, you're so financially unhealthy, well, they're making those calls. The idea is that there is a downstream effect to this and there are patterns that we can see, especially if you're a portfolio company holding other companies. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Yes. Thanks so much for doing this briefing today. And his question was the first part of my question. Yes, it could be used for evil. I do believe that as adversaries become more sophisticated and include other competencies, there's no doubt that this could be used for that. But if you put on your hat as a risk practitioner now and think of not only as a recovering CISO, but as a risk practitioner, this data, especially the MGM kind of six phases, there are five phases, informs a changing risk landscape where certain things could be more impactful to an organization. Do you think that that kind of analysis, because most of this has been about financial analysis in the context of cyber threats, but do you think it could be used in reverse to say, we now have some financial conditions or strategic pivots or shifts that represent different kinds of risk that maybe we hadn't considered before? So my question makes sense? It does, okay. yeah, so basically, We've been looking for the smoke signals, but can it also shine a light on what good looks like? And the answer is potentially yes, right? Because again, the idea of posting a 10K or an 8K or is posting the best effort numbers of what you're doing at that time. And the idea is to both combine the analysis, the numbers, right? The math with the words. There's no math behind the words. But the idea is again, to look for those patterns, triggers, and then provide the financial analysis view to quantify this. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. 
Yeah, I feel like I have kind of a simple question. Sure. Uh, are, are there high level indicators of, of uh, I guess, in a compromise situation where there's a loss of a revenue loss, where there's no impact at all in the stock price? Like, are there certain things that jump out to you where you're like, yeah, that's probably not going to impact the stock price, whether vertical or? You know, it, it's really, um, so the question is, if, is, there a, is there a scenario where a cyber event being disclosed does not trigger a, uh, a little blip? Is that correct? Yes. And so in my experience and in what we've seen so far, we've not seen that right now. And we've seen at least a, mar a marginal dip really it's too soon to tell, right? Because you've seen service disruptions and then you've seen the question, so what, right? Well, the transfer of risk comes in the form of say cyber insurance. So you're able to go through and reestablish, but then what happens to the overall, you know, the reputation of the company and some of those intangible things. And so whether there's a primary loss or a secondary is still part of what risk management looks at. So there's the immediate, but then there's the longer term, and that's basically what we're doing is building those models, building those patterns, and building those profiles to compare. Cool. That's super interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. Well, this is how to interact with me. So Brandon at firetowerai.com, I'm on LinkedIn, and I thank you all so very much for the time and the opportunity to share this, and uh, happy to keep the dialogue going. So I'll be here for a little bit, and thank you all very much for your time.